Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are going to start in a few minutes. Can I kindly invite you to get closer here to the center? As we are not a huge crowd, it might, might be useful to be closer. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this open uh, forum uh, from the European uh, Commission. Um, and thank you for being with us just before the lunch break. So, um, my name is Christina Monti. I work in DG Connect. And uh, um, in this open forum, we, we would like to present to you a, a recently launched initiative by the European Commission, which is called uh, Next Generation Internet. Um, I will briefly uh, mm, uh, explain the context of this initiative and why uh, this is relevant uh, for uh, internet governance. Then my colleague Valentina Schalpi uh, will explain in more detail where we are at the moment and what are the next uh, uh, steps. Uh, then uh, we have uh, two colleagues from uh, Gartner, um, um, Clementine Ferleyer and Catherine Feral. Um, they will um, uh, present a, a study that the European Commission has uh, asked them to, to perform to help us develop uh, a longer term strategies, uh, strategy and to uh, identify uh, what are the most uh, promising priority areas uh, where uh, the Commission uh, should invest in terms also of research activities. So, uh, on the context, very briefly, um, you might be aware that the uh, European Commission over the last years has been very active in internet governance uh, and uh, uh, has uh, been promoting a vision uh, of a free and open internet, uh, a vision where uh, human rights and democratic rule of law are, uh, are defended and promoted also online. And this has led to an increasingly clear vision also supported by all uh, European member states uh, that sees the multi-stakeholder model as very important in, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, what, uh, so we will continue in, in this direction, so we will continue promoting and defending this multi-stakeholder approach. Um, uh, but we also see that uh, uh, the discourse in internet governance is now shifting. So uh, from a debate that was predominantly focused on the technical layers um, of, the, of the internet, at the core of the internet, and that's, you know, culminated uh, uh, in 2016 in the successful IANA transition, we see in internet governance that the discussions are now moving and focusing more on the uh, social and economic uh, challenges that the uh, digital revolution is, is bringing. And so we see this as a very complex interplay of issues to which no single stakeholder has all the answers and where the multi-stakeholder can really uh, provide uh, the only uh, way forward. So, 
Uh, this leads us to think that we need a, a more holistic uh, uh, and multidisciplinary approach. And in this context, uh, we uh, would like to uh, reorient also our research activities into ensuring that the internet of the future will have the users and the citizens at the core of it. Um, we think that as European Union, we have much to contribute into this debate uh, in precisely defending the vision of an open and, and free internet. And we believe that we have strong foundations already there. Uh, like for instance, we have uh, uh, strong rules on um, uh, privacy and data protection. We have strong competition rules. We have clear rules on net neutrality. Uh, and also uh, we have strong uh, consumer protection rules. And so this is, these are areas where we think it's, it's, it's important. So in this context, uh, why uh, the next generation internet? So the, the whole concept behind this is really to harness the potential uh, of uh, the internet for development and social good. Uh, and that is why um, we have started a reflection on how will the internet evolve and uh, how can we bring research and policy together to the benefit of, of, uh, of the citizens. So by introducing this human centricity, we aim precisely at, at an internet that delivers more to people than it does uh, today. So, and with this uh, short introduction, I will now leave the floor to my colleague uh, Valentina. Thank you. Good, <coughs> good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, we will try to engage you, but also be brief because we all know that it's lunchtime. Um, as my colleague Christina mentioned, this new um, initiative of the European Commission called Next Generation Internet was launched last autumn in 2016 uh, in a multi stakeholder approach. In fact, we conducted online and offline consultation and we received a number of contributions by different stakeholders, including civil society, um, private sector, researcher, etc. And <clears throat> we decided to, to base the initiative, uh, the research initiative, in an, on, a, on an agile and flexible method based on uh, European values. That's why in European that are also reflected as human values, including inclusiveness, decentralization, and right to privacy and uh, control over data. Uh, the result of our uh, effort in the consultation last year provided us three main pillars for research this year. The three main pillars are privacy enhancing technology, is one. The second one focus on decentralized data governance, and the third one is uh, discovering and identifying technologies. Um, we have right now open the call for proposal, for research proposal. Uh, it's called uh, ICT24 call, and it will run until April 2018. But the effort will not stop there. We will continue for 2019 as well. And the, um, the long-term strategy of the NGI is to set as a main pillar for the framework program um, of the European Commission for, uh, for the next framework program that is called uh, FP9 that will run from 2021 until 2028. So we're talking about a time frame of 10 years. Uh, as I mentioned, it was through an effort of public consultation and multi-stakeholder consultation that we came up with the three pillars for the 2018 call. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we, we continue consulting and engaging stakeholders through uh, a consultation platform that we run on our NGI website and will uh, basically feed together with the effort of our other partners like the NGI study, uh, will feed and will provide us the three or more topics and pillars for research for the 2019 call. And, uh, at the same time, we'll provide the long-term strategy and vision for the, uh, the long-term the time frame that we have for the next 10 years. And without further ado, I will leave it to our colleagues in Gardner that will provide you more, more details on the long-term strategy. Yes, uh, thank you, Valentina. 
Um, so I will uh, introduce the NGI study that we um, worked on uh, since um, March uh, this year. Um, so when funding research on the future internet, um, it's really difficult to make a long-term prediction of what are the winning technologies, what are the business models, or even what would be the social acceptability that the new, that the new global users, uh, leaders will be using. So this is why there, uh, we need a new approach to funding research. It'll have to combine continuous stakeholder consultation, uh, long-term research, and also applied research. So our study uh, developed a research program that cultivates research in a different way. So the new model of research replaces the consortia doing basic research um, with cooperation and competition of organizations and individuals. It also involves different and new actors like startups and SMEs to carry out applied research. And the program uh, is built to continuously adapt itself. Um, NGI aims to build a lasting ecosystem that will accompany EU research all along uh, the way to the next generation internet. Um, our study started in March and it will end uh, next February. So what have we achieved in one year? We have liaised with the internet ecosystem at large, including the users, of course, and asked them what the future internet needs to be like and what needs to be fixed. We have listed all the technology topics which need attention and mapped the ongoing initiatives in research that we're addressing them already. We have built a research program with this new approach to address all the issues identified. And last but not least, we have defined the vision of the next generation internet, which leverage different drivers for change that are necessary today. So we are finalizing today all these points I mentioned. We have also identified all the benefits for the calls for proposals that we have listed. These calls will be presented by Catherine uh, just after uh, my presentation. And now we are disseminating our work broadly. So we are ensuring the broad internet ecosystem is aware and part of this. This is why we're here today, of course, but we will also be at various um, popular open source developers conferences, as well as ministerial and other political conferences. Um, the study team is a partnership between Gartner and NLNet. So Gartner brings deep insight on the tech market and its evolution and experience in anticipating disruption and planning for it. NLNet, a foundation based in the Netherlands, is founded on many of the same reasons that the study is mandated for, to fund projects that fix the internet. And we have on board of our study main key organizations and stakeholders of the internet. To name only a few, the European Internet Exchange Association, EDRI, GEANT, FSFE, etc. So this was uh, an overview of uh, the aim of the study and where we stand today. I will now talk you through the vision for the next generation internet. Um, it is um, up on the screen above me. Um, the, the, the vision states that the next generation internet is an internet of human value. So the next generation internet shapes a value-centric, human and inclusive internet. The internet this way will enable human potential, mobility, and creativity. So this is the first of the four drivers for change that build a vision and that guide the whole research program that we have defined. The three other drivers for change are resilience, trustworthiness, and sustainability. So, the Internet of the Human Values needs a solid technical foundation to build on. And the next generation Internet needs to be robust. It needs to be adaptive and resilient in the face of evolution. Think about the Internet of Things that will place devices even in our bodies. Whatever companies or parts of the network go down by any disaster, the effects on the rest of us should be close to zero. So resilience is the second driver for change. But there's another dimension to trust. It's above this physical availability of the network. We need a transparent technological environment that is completely trustworthy. Transparent in terms of what data extracts, 
transparent in terms of being able to choose browsing profiles and understand their consequences. Just to give a few examples. Citizens and businesses should want to continue using the internet and feel trust when doing so. So by design, the NGI should protect free speech and private enterprise. It aims to be a true global commons, and we will create the tools for this trustworthiness, <coughs> the third driver for change. The long-term success of the internet lies in its openness and its permission-free innovation. Interoperability is also key to sustainability, avoiding lock-in. So the NGI fosters diversity and decentralization. It grows the potential for disruptive innovation. But this extends far beyond the technical wheel. The NGI will achieve a sustainably open environment for the cultures and the economy. So what do we mean by this? An example would be the, uh, the notion of freedom of use of the internet, enabling local and multilingual communities to use the internet. Another example of sustainability and openness is greening the internet. How about providing transparency mechanisms on the environmental cost of the internet and on the different solutions that will make use of it? So sustainability is the fourth driver for change. This, um, for any questions, we have uh, this poster also at the, one of our, at, at the booth of the NGI. Um, and for the anecdote, we heard that Vint Cerf saw it yesterday and was really enthusiastic about it. So we're also looking very much forward to what you think of our, uh, of our first draft vision, obviously. Uh, and we're welcoming you to, uh, to interact with us. And now I will ask Catherine to talk about the work program and the impact that it will have. Sorry, just briefly to intervene, because I forgot to introduce, apologies for this, also Frederick <laughs> Donk from ISOC. The main purpose is wondering. on this panel <laughs> is to bring some gender balance. <laughs> True. No men, no panel. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside, um, Frederick is here because, uh, well, ISOC has uh, recently conducted a, a very interesting uh, exercise and which we believe is very relevant uh, also for next generation uh, internet initiative. And so um, uh, he will share with us uh, some of the lessons learned from, from that exercise and we think that this is also uh, you know, starting point for continuous engagement and, and, and discussions on these topics. So, sorry, <laughs> please, the floor is yours. Okay, the NGI is not just about stimulating the research and, and the development uh, in a number of, of very fascinating and interesting technology domains. Uh, we have seen that there was a lot of well-funded initiatives in the past and that have been trying to address some of the shortcomings we were mentioning or some of the objectives we have here, but they have delivered very interesting technologies, but that have not been rolled out at scale. One of the key uh, elements that we have been discussing in the consortium and with our partner, which is at the back of this uh, room here, hello, is, is really that to be sure that any results that will be coming out of these calls, out of these initiatives, can be really put into real life, into the broader internet. So that caused certain problems and also something that are embedded in the calls we want to propose to the commission and I'm going to mention in a moment. Uh, that there's going to be things coming from different teams. So each team is going to pro propose very interesting solutions. So the solutions in the various teams may well be, in a sense, difficult to integrate together or maybe having an impact on the overall internet when trying to put them together. The second thing is that all the changes that are going to be proposed to be rolled out at scale, the internet needs to still be working. So meaning that we need to think about something that for some of us may look like continuous integration, continuous testing, continuous development, in the sense that what is bringing economy um, growth and uh, um, allowing millions and billions of citizens to do what they have to do still needs to be working while we are trying to fix some of the flows of the infrastructure 
and while we are putting the new mechanisms that will be needed in order to have the visions really into practice. So that's one of the key elements we have been discussing and uh, it means that the teams that are going to be answering to the calls the commission is going to found needs to take, somebody needs to take ownership of the solution and of this integration test and deployment with it the broader internet. So uh, in a sense, it needs that there needs to be guidelines and there needs to be rules for each of the projects. So that's part of the things we are proposing to the commission. And it means also that there needs to be a certain level of automation in order to allow this scaling up, which by itself is going to be a call. Okay, so not only the call is going to try to find solution to enable this, but there's going to be a mechanism next to that in order to allow the solutions to be really working and providing the value they should be providing at scale. What does it mean? It means that perhaps what we are going to face is the largest collaboration issue ever in the history of technology because the internet is the biggest animal we have out there in terms of technology. And if a lot of teams are going to be working and changing things at the same time or in sequence, it needs to be coordinated. It needs to have a certain level of collaboration, which is very much into the topic of today's and these days things, which is about governance, but it is also about common rules, common procedures and common agreement on certain things that the projects will have all to take into account in order for this huge founding to be successful. So um, one of the other aspects in terms of collaborations is having different people collaborating to have more creativity. So one of the other underlying things we have been seeing discussing within the consortium and with the experts we have been interviewing is that there's a need uh, to have the calls targeting the specialized internet communities, the people that really know how to solve the issue, but they need to collaborate together because it's unlikely that the answer will be in one technology. It's going to be in a mix of different technology together and it's going to be the, the innovation is going also to come from startups, individuals, small companies that today are not used to, if I, you allow me, me these things, to deal with the complexity of answering calls for the commission, mm -hmm. which is by itself a sport that you need to master if you want mm -hmm. to be successful. So, so the, one of the key underlying principle of what we are suggesting in the NGI program project is really to enable this smaller and let's say very creative and nimble teams to collaborate together. One of the key things also that is going to be in our calls is the fact that the teams need to demonstrate how they are going to enable the vision so impact multiple drivers and as many drivers as possible would be likely a criteria. And also how they are going to deploy. So both the really visionary and the very practical aspect in order to have this money having an effective impact on the internet. Okay. So what we are going to share now with you in terms of the calls is really much a draft. We are still discussing it with the commission, but the underlying assumption is that there will be a certain number of things that will be funding during H 2020, so the current program, and there's things that will be in the next one uh, after 2020, uh, and that will be a continuation and an expansion and an expansion and new topics on the key topics I'm going to mention today. So take that as a draft, but as Clementine mentioned, the commission and ourselves, we are very keen to have feedbacks. And this program, this project, the NGI is very much collaborative. So as many feedback we can have as a topic is always welcome. That's part of the consultation of methodology of the project. So 
one of the things I mentioned before is as a precondition to have each project getting organized to have maintainability by design. Thank you for using maintainability. I have difficulty to say the word. Michael, that's really uh, one of my colleagues' fault. So, which means that they need to express what are the tools, what are the automated ways in order to do the changes at scale, and also to comply to some extent, comply is perhaps a big word, with the number of shared procedures and the application of best practices for each of the projects in order to be able to de deploy at scale. So it means that all these things are going to be put as a prerequisite in the call, but could be also a call by itself. One of the call in H2020 then is going to have a theme enabling trustworthiness. It's from a user point of view, and it's thinking about the platform that we're able to monitor the internet uh, with the transparency and with uh, both its security and the identity related issues. So for example, uh, you have somebody asking me, asking you money on your screen, and uh, you assume it's your daughter because she needs money. Are you sure it's your daughter? So all this kind is going to be the first topic of, of uh, the H2020 calls we want to suggest, enabling trustworthiness to be uh, um, aligned with uh, the driver for change. The second one is really much about architecture renovation, okay? Uh, it means that it's the underlying fabric of the internet and of the web itself that needs to be modified, that needs to be upgraded or changed in order to um, avoid some of the issue we are seeing today that were in fact by design created at the early stage of the internet because the internet was not done for what is used for today. So um, it means that we are having here an intent to have archi architectural weaknesses that are going to be solved for solution proposed that will look at this aspect, even at the lower level of the internet. The second thing is really to have lesson learned apply, taking into account some of the failures and um, trying to have a type of a clean state, simplifying, for example, uh, protocols and updating some of the parts that today needs to be updated. The third call we are uh, suggesting is really about openness is about ensuring for the users that they can have portable services and they can have what we call data decoupling. So it means that a user, you and I, could be able to use a service that is best thing matching their needs, uh, their ethics, their rights, their value, and they should be able to switch providers without what we call friction. So without losing your data, without losing things, without having a headache in order to change. And they also should be able to use the condition in which the services are run and where their data are stored. So that's one of the key things uh, we see for this openness call. And obviously the solutions have to be in a way that is preserving democracy and that is not creating other issues in the way that people are going to use the internet. Because that's one of the things we have discussed as well, is that many of the technology we could have in order to use to find security solution or find more openness could be used in a very bad way as well if they are misgoverned. So that's part of the things we also want to be sure that um, in the way it is expressed, we are not creating other problems if we can avoid them. There's several under other calls under discussion for the NGI, let's say, flagship program after uh, 2020 in the nice uh, number nine framework of the European Commission, likely. And it's about uh, 
probably the idea being um, user-friendly transparency mechanism for one. A second one is really empowering uh, the user for their freedom of choice. So it's very much like what I said for H2020 on steroids. So accelerating the money and the efforts and adding learnings of what is going to be done in the current framework and seeing how to accelerate that in the next one. Another point is about also going on working on maintainability because maintainability is a life cycle, it's for life. If you cut the money after a while, you're never going to deploy and have the things going on uh, correctly. Another aspect that is going only to be launched in the next one is uh, what we said about greening the internet. So being sure that all these extra changes on the infrastructure and everywhere doesn't have too much consumption of uh, natural resources, not impact too much the planet in terms of pollution, or decrease the impact we already have today. So that's another topic also under discussion. So another thing we want to have as an underlying principle is that the assessment of the cold answer, so for the respondents, would be really very much again in terms of their demonstration of both fueling the drivers, so answering the issue from an end user perspective and not only from a techniocentric perspective. And the last thing that obviously that it needs to be put at scale. I'm done. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I think, I mean, from my perspective, uh, these are very promising uh, areas. We, we are well aware that the internet is uh, just at, at the beginning. It's still at its infancy and uh, we still have to see uh, many more developments in, in, in the future. So without further ado, uh, Frederick, mm -hmm. if you would like to share um, some views uh, on, on the exercise ISOC has conducted. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me and the Internet Society. As you said, we, we were able to contribute this NGI exercise. And I can see we have much in common. There is some shared DNA here in your report, in your course. So in a few minutes, I will be able to talk to you through that. You will find that uh, in your booth Internet Society booth over there. Uh, we also will find it online. Uh, before I get there, let me refer to some great book that I would, uh, would invite you to read uh, by Thomas Friedman. Uh, thank you for being late. And he sees us in what he calls the age of acceleration. He says that um, there are three big forces on planet Earth right now, and that would be uh, technology, globalization, and climate change. And the three firsts are really working, operating right now at once. So it might create fear. And this is what we see. We see um, uh, governments uh, building walls, uh, shutting borders for whatever's happening, including in Europe. Um, when it's about the internet, there's temptations to just control the internet, manage it in a way that you just uh, are able to see what's happening on it or shut it down. I mean, as it's uh, really happened a lot those uh, last, last months. Um, I must say I have some empathy for those uh, politicians who, who have to respond to those crises who face uh, so many challenges, but obviously they don't have the right tools. Um, they are using tools from the past to address issues from today and from tomorrow. Um, take encryption. Um, that is a big deal, including in Europe for most governments. Uh, what we see is that there are a high temptation to try to manage it, or to try to remove it, uh, or to try to have access to it, period. We believe there are many other options, right? Um, um, but that means that we should offer uh, new tools to address those new issues of those days. Uh, and we believe that the consensus build approach is one of them. This is what we spend our time discussing uh, here those days. Um, so let's think about that when, when we go through uh, any conversation about the internet of the future. So, we started an exercise in 2016. Um, took us a year to digest more than 3,000 uh, response. Uh, we've been through more than 100 uh, interviews uh, across the globe 
um, speaking to leading lights um, from technology, from the technical community, um, from government, uh, experts, um, academics, civil society, of course. So it took us a long time, and we decided that we would not try to uh, polish the crystal ball and tell you what it is that will happen uh, soon. I mean, others have done that in the past, and we've seen the results. Uh, you know, the internet uh, never forgets anything, so, so we would not even take a risk to try to predict the future. Uh, yet, we thought we would try to show what we call the drivers of change. And we have um, uh, identified through the many answers that we've got six drivers of change. Uh, the internet and the physical world, AKA the internet of things, um, artificial intelligence, cyber threats, internet economy, interoperability and standards, and then the role of governments. I won't develop on all of this. Uh, I, I'd like to give you a sense of what we discovered. And, and maybe the first um, big issue that I see we, we, we heard uh, from the community that we consult was a shared sense, a mixed sense of optimism and disillusion, especially from those people who invented and created and helped create in the internet. I mean, there was an open platform, right? Openness is good, but in the same time, it's also allowed the bad guys to join the club. So um, it also um, uh, was created as a platform for exchange based on trust, and then suddenly we see we might lose that trust. And you know what happens if you lose that trust. It means that all the promises, economic, uh, uh, political, uh, personal, social, societal development of the internet, you just can't say bye-bye to this. So, Make sense of optimism and disillusion, and, and, and also between regions. Uh, it was interesting to see that in our Western countries, people are fairly negative and, and skeptical, while when you go in Africa, you see people uh, see their life being improved by the promise of the internet. So this is also maybe something uh, different by regions. Uh, first, um, we have heard that indeed we need to implement new thinking, new models. Uh, I just described one of those. But people say, hey, um, in order to address the issues of the internet, we definitely need to tackle new models of thinking, new model of resolution of problems. Um, ethics is something that came back quite often. Um, we need to put users, but also human and human rights at the center of anything that we might be discussing, especially when we're talking about artificial intelligence algorithms uh, where you see little interference from human beings in that. And maybe one of the, um, of the important stuff that uh, I recollect from this was cyber threats. Nearly everybody says that we need to address cyber threats because if we don't, um, uh, and we don't take that as a priority, we take the risk um, to undermine the famous trust, and we know that this is the cohesive base on how the internet works. So let me talk a bit about cyber threats, um, uh, in particular because this will be strengthened, emphasized by, you need to tell me how much I uh have. -huh. We're specifically almost done. Actually. We're done? It's, it's at, at, at what time? 120. Oh, no, no, for, okay, we had a few minutes, but then... As a minority, I claim the right yeah, to yeah, speak yeah. a little bit more. <laughs> we have okay. a few more minutes. Thank you. So, cyber threats. Um, um, I know we're talking here with the European Commission and European Union, where probably we have the GDPR soon. Um, so, not you address some of, the, <laughs> some of those. Yeah. Sure. We need to see who will be complying, by the way. But, but we have it, right? And this is a wonderful stuff. You, we should be very proud of it. Europe is showing a lead. Uh, but yeah. at global level, we need to rethink accountability of many stakeholders and many players, including and maybe first the data handlers, which the DGPR does, by the way. So we need to reinvent uh, incentives and, and, and liability models. So, in the last two minutes that I have, uh, <laughs> let me drive you, but you will find that on this uh, report that you will find online. Um, we got recommendations, we got nine recommendations. Um, let me pick three of them. Human values must drive technical development, not the other way around. Uh, we, this is about ethics, right? I remember this line that keeps obsessing me, and that is that youth and the new generations 
are not attracted by a mission anymore, but they're driven by value. So we need to address values first. Um, well, we need to apply human rights online as well as offline. We need to recall government that shutting down the internet is not a solution. It's not a political tool that you can use. And last but not least, sorry to insist on this, but encryption is one of those means that will help recover trust. And uh, encryption is not a threat to security, far from it. So this is a new paradigm that we need to keep in mind. I would love to continue, but I understand <laughs> that my time is over, so thank you and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, uh, I think these remarks are really interesting and, and I see a lot of interconnections and, and also what uh, uh, the Commission is uh, aiming at with this uh, uh, next generation uh, internet initiative. So uh, I would now like to open the floor for any questions or remarks or suggestions you might have. Yes, please, the gentleman over there. <coughs> Well, I think uh, on the stage uh, when you're talking about uh, GDPR, you know, uh, in the European commissioning and pushing the, you know, some kind of data production to the global. But to be honest, I feel a little bit one worry about something will be happen. First of all, you might be were thinking about what is a GDPR really can apply. I believe some of the country, they don't care. And you can believe, you know, some country, they just uh, don't follow the, the GDPR. And, and you cannot do anything about it. That's the first problem I think we will face about the GDPR. The second problem of the GDPR, when you apply, then you actually create a trouble for many countries. Um, for those of country, they do they do respect the European commissioning of the GDPR, and for those of country, they don't care about the European commissioning the the GDPR. You actually develop or generate the disadvantage for those of country. They don't res they do respect you. And you really give the advantage for those of the country they don't respect. And I think, I don't know how, how, how you think about the issue will be happen. And, but I, I foresee they will really happen very soon next year. I don't know if the panelists want to react uh, on this, but maybe I can just uh, give a, a, a quick answer concerning the GDPR per se, which is a little bit out of the scope of this uh, open forum, but uh, the GDPR actually is not something very new, even if it's entering into application uh, in a few months, it is based on rules that in Europe we have been having for the last 20 years. And actually also it is something that uh, is really uh, about citizens' rights and uh, if companies uh, are dealing with data belonging to European citizens. Now, these are the rules that have been established in a democratic way uh, by a European Parliament and by all uh, the governments of the European Union. So this is now uh, the rule of law, uh, which has been shaped in a, in a very democratic uh, context. So uh, this is what I can say concerning the data protection rules that we have uh, in Europe. I understand that, uh, you know, this might create uh, more problems for uh, certain companies that are in other countries, but if they are selling products or providing products to European citizens, well, these are the rules they have uh, to comply with. Um, and actually, uh, from, uh, you know, our perspective, we are really proud of these rules. These are really, you know, at the core of the values that we would like to, to promote in the future. So this is what I can say, but again, uh, uh, I think this is a little bit beyond the scope of this, uh, of this open forum. Yes, we have a question over there. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Kadu. I'm a UFIGF Isaac, Isaac Fellow from Brazil. <coughs> and when we're talking about uh, next generation internet and building this 
human values, core values that we want to see online. I think that the youth has a, has a, a, a major ro role to play too. We're talking about reshaping the, the research in the internet. We're talking about, we, you addressed some few, some great and important points that we need to focus when we're thinking about this next generation internet. But I'd like to see a little bit more about what are your plannings on youth engagement and fomenting this kind of initiatives. I saw a lot of youth programs here in ISOC, uh, in ISOC, no, <laughs> in the IGF. I'm a part of one of these youth programs. And we're talking about this maintainability of these projects, I think that we must think in projects that are turned especially for the youth too. Because we are, we, most of the research, not, not most of it, but a, a vast amount of the research that is directed to the internet is also coming from youth fellows, from youth that are producing knowledge, not only in Europe, actually in Brazil, we see a lot of this too in all over the world. So what do you guys, what do you folks then think about? Yes, actually, <coughs> our uh, research initiative will address, among other researchers, I mean, one of the, our main uh, group is young postdoc and young, young researcher that will contribute in a multidisciplinary way. So computer scientists, software engineers and developers, but also social scientists and others, so humanities and all fields. And uh, yeah, it actually is one of the group we are targeting. Now, I'm not a young researcher and postdoc. So the youth is there. And also actually startup and SMEs. And startup and, and SMEs normally includes uh, a lot of young, brilliant uh, minds. So it is covered among others. Yes, please. Uh, me, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm Helga Mühling from the Austrian Ministry of uh, Transport, Innovation and Technology. Uh, so thank you very much for your presentation. It was fascinating, interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like to know if there isn't a certain danger of uh, increasing a fragmentation risk. The internet is global. And if you concentrate only on European efforts, uh, this is certainly something we support very much. But we are not alone in the world. So please have a look at the global development. Uh, also in view of the sustainable development goals, uh, this is something we have to look closer at. Thank you. Yeah, and please also if my colleagues want to add something, but yes, for sure, actually, in our proposal now for FP9, which is the next framework program, we included specifically connected to the NGI, uh, a connection to the SDG focusing on ICT number nine, saying that the, the next generation internet, among other things, needs to help uh, inclusiveness and access broadly and globally. So we also address that part, but we, we need to work more for sure. And the vision states that the NGI should be a true global commons. Yeah. So we are not framing anything uh, European around the Euro around the European territory. Uh, thank you. My name is Bank Burry from the Swedish regulator. I have a qu it's a similar question, but given that the big internet companies are from the U.S. and all the economic uh, interest around the digital economy is really where the U.S. has been extremely well doing quite well, but while Europe is really lagging, SIP is coming far down on the list on economic terms becomes market value. So how do you take that into consideration when you do this uh, mapping of the industry and what kind of forces are in play here for, for this uh, research program? Thank you. Maybe, maybe I, I can try to uh, uh, reply to those. And First of all, thank you also for, for your very uh, relevant uh, questions and uh, you're really touching some of the, of the issues that we are also uh, trying to address. Uh, we are very well aware that uh, we lack uh, big players and, and actually this effort of investing research money in a more strategic approach that's uh, really our um, contribution or our hope to help uh, develop new champions as well, uh, based on our strength. Um, and uh, uh, that is why also uh, there is this um, effort to mobilize um, also from bottom up uh, research efforts. So we try to develop a, a, a new methodology in, in, and, and a more strategic approach in the way we provide funding for research in Europe to try to address specifically these weaknesses that we have identified. 
Can I take it? Yeah. Thank you for these uh, comments, actually. You know we are obsessed here in Europe about this, and some governments des desperately try to find a way to attract investors and to new big champions. But on, on the Internet, things might evolve so rapidly. And uh, I believe the principle is that we all can do competition on, on the Internet, not wave or buy or through the Internet and trying to manipulate the, the networks. Things might change because I believe that the, Euro the, the European values um, enshrined in the treaty but also in the regulations take network neutrality are to me a guarantee to innovation precisely. When I see, uh, I just don't want to launch this conversation here, but when I see, but I did, when I see, uh, yeah, I launched GDPR and now I will launch new <laughs> policy, so I will completely hijack this conversation. But when I see um, uh, what's happening in the US right now, uh, with some thoughts from these current administrations on how they want to address the neutrality, I believe that Europe, if we maintain this openness and this guarantee, might just still promote innovation. It might just be a big change and a shift in paradigm at the worldwide level. And I believe this is a good lesson, that the openness and some guarantees to the Internet might just also guarantee more innovation and economic development. Thank you. Okay, there is an online question and uh, from Nuno Garcia. Um, she's saying government first panelists started by saying that this is a dynamic area and that is and that in reality nobody really knows what to expect from NGI. And this makes a lot of sense. But then she says that we have listed all the technology topics that need attention. So the question is, is this a closed list? What does this mean? There are no tech radars, innovation radars in place? Thank you. Yeah, well, it's a good question. Yes, it's a, it's a good question. It gives the opportunity to clarify this point of the uh, dynamic approach uh, that will be given to defining the work program. So, of course, obviously, at this point, we have a list of technologies today that need fixing today. Um, but we're also working in a bimodal way in the sense that we are being uh, agile and flexible in the way the, the work program will be defined in five years based on the needs that will be seen in five years. Yeah, and also that, as I mentioned before, um, on the NGI website, we still have up and running an online consultation platform where you know, we, we collect uh, more feedback and we engage stakeholders to suggest us what will be also in the future. Because for the FP9, uh, uh, it's, it's 2021 to 2028, it's a long time frame, especially from now. And yes, unfortunately, we, we cannot know now what will need to be fixed or to be supported in a few years. So that's, that's still open, it's not fixed, no. Thank yes, you. please. Uh, Florent Tuvena from the University of Zurich. Uh, a very quick question. On your slide, you state that um, the NGI actually strives at reimagining and re engineering the internet for the third millennium and beyond. <laughs> now, are, are you really serious about that? Or? Can I answer that? Um, I think at this point we have to uh, name the author of that yeah. sentence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm dead serious about it. I mean, if you think about how fossilized technology becomes, telephony is 150 years old. And if you look at what the end user device is from a century ago, from the actual telephony, so not the VoIP technology, but it, 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 if this fossilizes into society, if, if, if there's not a technology that's, that has the potential to fossilize as the internet is fossilizing, because it's so ingrained in everything that it's very hard to change. So we may have a shot at changing it once, but we're actually just on generation one only. There's the next generation is the second generation. We're still on one. And, and we, if you think of any person on the internet now, and you have to say something, and I can kill you if you lie about him, you can't say he's using IPv6. You can't say he's using any other technology than TCP IP, UDP, SMTP, uh, uh, HTTP, and from there on, we're going into the dark countries. From there on, you start having risk of a Russian Russian roulette. So it's it's very fossilized already, and if we ha even have a single shot, 
I, yeah, what else can replace it? So it could potentially last a thousand years. It could be shorter, but it could potentially last a thousand years. Thank you very much. So this is a way to show the level of ambition of this. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's true. So, um, but we need the help of everyone. All, all the stakeholders course. involved. Indeed, indeed. So, if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to really thank you very much for uh, being here uh, with us today. Uh, on my side, I'm really happy that uh, for the first time uh, while we are attending uh, the IGF, we are able to bring forward uh, uh, a very concrete initiative that we are doing this and trying to build uh, new synergies and bridges with the the internet governance uh, stakeholder community and uh, the research uh, uh, stakeholders that, that, that we are already addressing in, in other parts of the commission. So I think this was a, a very good first step from my perspective. And uh, um, I also finally invite you to get in touch with us or visit the website if you uh, would like to have more information. Thank you very much. Or the